Hey there, it's Andre with uh, another interview episode of the Impulsive Thinker podcast for the high achieving ADHD entrepreneur. Today's episode is brought to you by Kadak, the Center of ADHD Awareness Canada. Today I have Keith Gellhorn, who's the founder and chief empowerment officer, CEO of advocacy.org, and that's A D D Vacacy. Um, hi, Keith, how are you doing? Thank you for joining us. I'm doing great, thanks. Um, Tell us a little bit about advocacy.org and uh, what it's about and who you serve. Sounds good. So, um, yeah, so I'll just say my name is Keith Gellhorn. I, uh, I own Advocacy. Um, basically, how I started it was um, uh, the fact that I got diagnosed late in life. So I got diagnosed when I was 34 uh, with ADHD. Well, I started off actually with anxiety and depression after losing my job as a plumber. And uh, back in... There was in the economic downturn, essentially. And uh, anyways, my company that I worked with went from 77 of us to four in six months. And I was one of the last guys cut. So at that point in time, I uh, had a bit of a, a breakdown and I got diagnosed with uh, anxiety and depression. And then a couple months later with ADHD, how I got diagnosed with ADHD was through a series of symptoms. Um, I, uh, I was... I had something called flash anger. So I go from zero to 102 seconds. I'd be yelling, screaming, punching walls, road raging. And I had no idea why I was doing it because 99% of the time I was the nicest guy out there. And uh, so anyways, they said, well, I think you have ADHD. And I was like, nah, this kid's is kind of bouncing off the walls. Um, that's not me. Right. And they gave me this book called, you mean I'm not stupid, lazy or crazy, had to read, read Great this book. flash anger thing. And I was like, holy crap, this is totally me. Uh, how did nobody see this, right? And uh, so anyways, that began began a two and a half year kind of self-discovery. Um, so I was able to get into the mental health system, uh, following a push from my uh, fiance at the time. And uh, I got in and I was able to see a counselor same day, same time every week. And um started to make some good progress and until session nine, until she said, you know, Keith, you only get 10 sessions. I'm very, feel very fortunate. I got those 10 sessions. That's in British Columbia where I'm from um, here in Nova Scotia, where I live now, you get three and you're out. So at session nine, I was like, well, I'm not leaving. <laughs> right. I said, I've been looking for help all this time. You finally give me a bit of an answer. I'm making progress. I'm dealing with all my crap. How do I get, to the next level and said, well, the only way to get there is if you're suicidal. I'm like, cool, give me the phone. So we're doing the intake. I literally did it on the phone with my therapist in the room, uh, gets to the question, oh, are you going to take your life? Yep. I'm going to drive my car right off the bridge on the way home, maybe hit a bus if I'm lucky. And they said, well, that doesn't sound very good. And uh, I said, no, it's not. And they said, maybe you should stay. I said, great. Hung up the phone. It was kind of like, uh, it's kind of like an ADD thing is to, uh, you always get, we always get to where we want to get if we're determined to get there. Right. Yeah. And so I got to stay and I stayed, like I said, for two and a half years. So I did uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I did grief therapy because I'd actually lost my uh, dad to suicide at my birth dad to suicide a few years before. Um, I did anger management. I did basically anything you possibly think of. And I went from a very uh, kind of, I'd say introverted, low self-confident, um, feeling like an imposter and basically everything that I was doing to pretty confident, right? Like it was a 180 shift. Yeah. And uh, you had more clarity and understanding of yourself. Yeah. I started to get to know myself, but there came a point where therapy wasn't good. And uh, it was a bit of a breaking point, I guess. And what do you mean so by that? It was starting not to be good. Well, what, what happened was, is I knew I, if you ask me about myself, like, uh, you know, do I identify my black and white thinking and my imposter syndrome and my catastrophization of, of situations, it just kept coming up kind of the same thing. We were talking about the same thing every week, right? Is, and is in the clinical system, while it serves a point, they help you, they can help you if you're broken. As soon as you start to feel better, they the therapy kind of stops and they don't know what to do 
And, uh, and that's kind of the point that I came to. I was like, man, I, I know why I think and act and feel the way I do. Thank you for helping me get to this point. I really appreciate it. Now I want to get over here. What so do I do now? now? And they, yeah, right, there was right. nobody there. And so, so the only thing they could offer me was this uh, connection to a psychiatrist. Well, I phoned them and uh, I didn't hear back a word from the psychiatrist, not even from the, the secretary for a year. I missed the phone call. And when I phoned them back, I just got answering machine after answering machine. I was like, this is pointless. So finally in 2010, I had a back injury at work killed my plumbing career altogether. And uh, about a month later, I found an ADHD support group down in Vancouver, sat with some people, kind of felt and acted like I did. I'm like, holy crap, I'm home, right? People. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of, and even talking to you, Andre, like, you know, we've only met twice. Yeah. But there's just a certain connection you get. get Yeah, we we get get it. it. Yeah, yeah. And and it's an instant. It's like we've known each other for years. Yeah. But I, you know, just met. Yeah. And that's the important thing to like Keith saying is the, there is, there, there's a community out there. There, there are, more, are people like us out there and you just got to find it. I remember walking into my first Kadak conference. Yeah. I just remember walking through the front door. This was shortly after I got diagnosed a few years ago. And it's just, I just walked in, they said, hi. And then right away, it just felt like I know these people, like these yep. people, this, they get me. I haven't even met anyone yet. It's just an energy in the room or around us. Yeah. It's a weird, weird thing. It's like the minute, minute I talk to somebody, I can tell right away, do you have ADHD yeah. or not? And yeah. it's people. And I was like, I'm not out to diagnose anybody no. by any means. It's just, we get this, it. We get, we get you. It. Yeah. And we get you. And we, right. yeah, that's how it is. So, so I'm sitting in this room and I'm like, this is awesome. And all my life, I'd always, I worked in the trades, but that's not where I wanted to be. I always wanted to be in the helping field. I was, uh, um, I started out pretty young volunteering in uh, community centers with people with autism and um, Down syndrome. I did some schooling in high school that was around like human services stuff. Mm -hmm. I went off to school to be a social worker, but um, sitting in school is like sitting in jail for me. No offense. It's like being in an office is the same way. That's why I work from home and I can work from wherever I want. But, uh, but my grades didn't reflect my, my uh, desire to, to help. So I was basically funneled out saying I'd never succeed in this, this world because I couldn't, I wasn't great at school. That was my jam. So that I wasn't great at school. I just didn't want to do all the crap like economics and philosophy and all this stuff that didn't apply to where I wanted to be. This is another whole story in itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyways, over the years, I did Big Brothers and a whole bunch of stuff. And I always wanted to, and I used to actually coach uh, people at that work kind of informally. So uh, in that plumbing, when I worked for that plumbing company, when everything went down the tube, uh, on the job site I was on, uh, out of 10 of us that left, nine of us have our own businesses now. And I was just like, hey, Derek, yeah. you love being a goalie. You should be a goalie coach. Hey, you like doing this. You should be that. And they all went and did it. And then I stayed in plumbing and they, they came back to me like, why the hell are you still there? You motivate us out. Why are you there? So it was kind of this like full circle moment when I sat in that group and I w- went to the guy in the front of the room and I'm like, what do you do? And he tells me he's a coach. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, man, you don't want to get into it. People don't show up. They don't pay their bills. And I was like, well, that's a shitty attitude, right? I could do it better than this guy. And so I got into the ADD hyper focus, which everybody on this podcast will understand. I'm looking yeah. down in the States. There's about a thousand coaches at the time in Canada. There's only 50 and East of Ontario, there were none. And my, uh, wife to be at the time was, uh, from here. So I hopped on a plane Came out to Nova Scotia, just started off at the community college because uh, I was like, nobody's going to take a plumber serious. So I went into the college there and did uh, disability supports and services. And I met a woman named Joy LaRusic, who was uh, the disability resource facilitator. And I said, you know, yes, I want to come and do this schooling, but I want to be a coach. And she's like, that is an amazing idea. We've, you know, anything I can do to support you, I've got your back. Now, I have come up with a kajillion ideas and Andre, I'd love to know how many you've come up with. How many, <laughs> how many times have you shared your idea and somebody say, great idea. I'm going to support you hundred uh, percent. 
quite a few. Oh, uh, really? A, a few, but uh, the big one I have right now is supporting a, the, the ADHD transformation journey program I'm developing and this podcast. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So and that feels I, great. If, yeah. When somebody says, I believe in you or backs you, like I know Kadax has been helping you out. Mm-hmm. When somebody believes in you, it's, it's, it's a hard feeling because uh, most of our lives, we don't get that. Right. Um, oh, huge. Yeah, or, exactly. or they're like, well, that's stupid and nobody would ever pursue it. This is part of being a, an entrepreneur is uh, part of the fact that we have this uh, mentality of like, well, you tell me I can't do something. I'm going to prove you wrong. Right? That's the real reason I was in business. Exactly. <laughs> right. And and most people don't have that. Right. It's yeah. hard work getting it's persistent getting, resilience, as I exactly. call it. Yeah. So so long story short, that's all it took. Ten minutes with this woman. I'm like, all right, I hop on a plane sold my house, moved out to Nova Scotia and, and started from there. So basically how it started was I, I started doing like a, um, I was doing my full-time school during the day. I was taking a uh, coaching school at night and I started running an ADHD support group. I say for students, but it was mostly for myself because transitioning yep. there <laughs> from there to here was, was a tough road. And I wanted to try it out to make sure, you know, I had wicked imposter syndrome, right? I'd Oh, we all do. That never yeah, goes away as an entrepreneur, I think. I think once you 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 say, okay, I got over that part, then something comes up. Yeah. And, and I think if you've got the imposter syndrome, I like to see it as it's almost like a positive. I'm doing something right. I'm going the right direction, I think. And yeah. here and here it is. That was a complete ADHD thought moment because I never thought of this till now. And I'm taking imposter syndrome as a positive that I'm on the right track. That's I, I just came off a group coaching call with a bunch of ADHD entrepreneurs and that was what came up. So I've, it's, it's true. It's uh, if, if you're having that feeling, it's a feeling of, it's all is this is feeling of uncertainty. It's a wall that we've got to face, right? We're spirit. We're being stretched. Yeah. We're yeah. being stretched and all we need to do. And I, I like using visuals. So um, if that wall is there, typically what happens is anxiety kicks in. And this is where you think about the fight or flight, or freeze mm-hmm. response. There's the fight response, which you won't be able to see, but my knuckles are all messed up from back in the day from hitting things, from getting frustrated. So I see the wall, I hit the wall, and then I break my hand and, you know, start crying, whatever. Yeah. Uh, there's the, that's the fight. The the flight is like, well, man, there's some big barrier facing me. I'm just going to find a way around it or, um, or go the other way. And then there's the freeze. You sit at the base of the wall. But there's another way to get through this stuff, right? The other way is to look around, like, is there an end of the wall or is there a, a top to the wall or ceiling? Yep. And usually at the ceiling point are people that can help. So there's coaches, right. mentors, friends. Like I was always uh, remember one of my mentors said to me, like, who's who's the person that you, you want to meet, right? It started off with like the mayor, right? I had just moved to Nova Scotia. It'd be nice to meet the mayor. So I was at a networking event and the mayor was there and the premier was there. I was like, be lined it for the premier. And he's like, oh, Keith, you're a big guy like me and I'll never forget you. Right. He's like, have you met the mayor yet? No, I haven't, you know, uh, mm-hmm. introduced me there. And then a, a year later, you know, I met uh, Justin Trudeau and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I, I just realized that everybody out there that we're kind of comparing ourselves to, which is another common ADHD thing. We all, we're all just people, right? And yeah. there's the, the, most of us want to help is the thing. And if you ever do reach out to somebody who doesn't want to help, that's not the right person for you, right? So right. It's, it's not uh, on you to take care of that. No, no. And, and so that's kind of the same methodology that I've used for the, the coaching stuff is like, I'm here for you. Like anytime you want, reach out. As long <laughs> as you want to, on, on, and as long as you want to be helped, yes. you will do the work. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Like you can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped. And it's no. not on us. That's their decision. That's not on us. You know, as much as we want to, we empathize. Yeah. But at one point, like we should try. But there, there's a comes a point that we should look at and say, you know what? If they don't want to be helped, there's no point wasting my time anymore. No. And, this, this. and I'm of the, of the same mindset. So I always tell people, and I do this... I do like most coaches, I do a free like intake call mm-hmm. and on the call, get like a history of them and everything else. But I'm saying like, 
I'm, I'm only going to be a good coach for you is if you, one, you want to do the work and two, I'm the right guy for you. I'm, I may not be. Um, but there's, there's, like I said, in terms of this virtual wall, there's a whole whack of us up there that are willing to be there. So when you're ready, and if, if I happen yeah. to be your person, so be it. Yeah. So long story short, I, uh, I had intended to be becoming a clinical social worker because I thought the only way to really help people would be from a clinical lens. Um, uh, the tr traditional way of treating ADHD, like I said, is get your diagnosis, try medication and, you know, peace out. Right. Yeah. And, and this myth of the, the pills uh, fixing your life is bullshit. It's like, it's a piece of the puzzle but it's not everything. It's not the it's whole like, puzzle. Exactly. It's like putting on glasses. Yes, it can help you see, but you still have to know where you're going. And you that's, that was the how whole, to read. Sorry. Yeah, that was the whole point. Yeah. And you still have to learn how to read with the glasses. I like that analogy. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So. Um, so. Oh, yeah. What's your biggest. So running advocacy dot org. What's your biggest yeah. challenge? Your ADHD challenge. Like we still the symptoms are still going to be there. We just have to yeah. manage differently. So what's your child, your your big ADHD challenge that you, you struggle with content continuously. So from from my perspective. Uh, yeah, I would say my biggest challenge over the last decade is staying focused by a mile. Um, and the, how do you take care of that? Well, the <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> um, so most businesses start out, they write a business plan and then they go execute it, right? You have to kind of know where you're going in order to get there, right? That's the theory. That's the theory. <laughs> uh, so the, how my business plan started, I was just handed a client uh, and this person uh, came from one of the big universities. They couldn't help them, happened to land on me and I had six weeks to help them get from A to B. And uh, anyways, um, you know, a lot of challenges came up from that. I had no process. I had, I didn't even have a bank account. I had nothing. Right. Um, so I had to kind of figure out on the fly, start a corporation. Cause that's what it seemed. My dad said to do it. So it's like, do that. He's an accountant and, uh, uh, started this business and just started kind of mm -hmm. executing. I would say my biggest challenge along the way is, is keeping reined in. Um, yeah. Yeah. so so I had a lot of success very early on my first, I had one client, my first year, the second year I had 10 and I got permission to coach at every post-secondary institution, in Nova Scotia. That same year, I won entrepreneur of the year. I started working with, uh, I get, got funding to work with uh, people in career exploration right. and entrepreneurs. And then all of a sudden I'm in 40 people. I had 40 clients a week doing all these presentations and my brain's just firing on a million miles a minute. Okay. Um, so with all that success, yep. then what's your ADHD strength that got you there? The, the, the strength that got me there was sheer, like, uh, I, I learned this actually in therapy was putting my blinders on and, and just focusing on kind of the end goal. My end goal was I'm going to be successful one way or another. So you're hyper focused on that. Yeah. So I was hyper focused on that. Yeah. I was hyper focused on just filling my schedule to be honest. Yeah. Like, Oh, like I wanted, I, yeah. I coach on 45 minute increments. So I go 8.30 to 9.15, 9.30 to 10.15, all the way through the day. And the more full my schedule is, the more routine I have, the more happier focused. I am. And more yeah. focused you actually and more are. more focused I am. Because you got yeah. a structure in place. Yeah, because like the thing is, either you're hyper-focused to get success, and as long yeah. as you control it effectively, um, then it's a positive thing. Or like for me, when my first 20 years of my career, I hyper-focused on my career and ignored everything else. Yeah. So there's a balance between it. It's a great thing, but if it's not managed or harnessed effectively, it has negative consequences. Oh, this so I is love it. that. I love that. Now, your biggest success with advocacy, you're telling me offline here, was your model, your business model. Yeah. Can you, we got a few minutes here. Can you just explain to me how you created advocacy around, uh, what was it called, grant or uh, provincial funding or yeah. whatnot? So, so it started off with uh, that first client that I had um, was a student and I didn't want the student to have to pay for coaching. So, um, uh, and who does, right? <laughs> like who's got yeah. money for it? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it's like an ADHD tax. We got to pay for all this therapy, coaching, whatever to get us through. Late fees, but, payments. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. of that stuff, right? Is uh, part, of, part of being us. Speeding tickets. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got one of those recently. Uh, the uh, so anyways, I was like, so how do I get paid to do this? So um, in the academic setting, there's two ways. You either be a tutor or you can be something called like an academic strategist. And mm. uh, if the tutors get paid 25 bucks an hour with a master's degree. The academic strategies are strategists at the time were about 50 bucks an hour. And I was like, well, fuck it. I'll just call myself an academic strategist, then, right? And all of a sudden I'm, I'm doing well. So basically it's not me who gets the funding. The students can apply. So basically at the post-secondary level, there's, there's uh, grants that are called uh, uh, post-secondary, uh, what are they called? Um, the student loan grants for students with permanent disabilities. So if you're a post-secondary student and you have uh, ADHD, uh, any kind of mental health, any kind of disability period, you can qualify for up to $24,000 a year in grants. Okay, so um, we're talking, we're referencing Canadian programs here. Canadian, yes. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's some equivalent programs in the United States or other countries across the world. You just got to look at your local uh, state or legislature. Unfortunately, in the States, they have to pay for everything, yeah. usually. Like, they, there's not the same things. There are grants, and I can get into those in a bit. No, no, but, but I just want to but, point out there could yeah. be similar programs, but what we're referencing is mainly is in Canadian, Canada. Right yeah. So, so as a Canadian student, if you take a student loan out and you check the box as having a disability, you can get 24 grand a year. So you, basically how it works out is you get $2,000 per semester right off your tuition. Mm -hmm. And then you get the Canada st study grant for students with permanent disabilities, but the services and equipment grant. On the services side, you can get coaching from us, um, like six hours of tutoring, writing in a private room. Um, uh, note takers, all kinds of different things. You can even get accommodations specifically at community college where you can spread your two year diploma over three or four years right. and you have to pay for the two years. On the equipment side, you get like two grand for a laptop, noise canceling headphones, any kind of a right. stack you can think of. So there's, there's tons there. So does that include so, coaching? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, so like, yeah. like the one thing I was really impressed is you really brought this, you're, you're, you're you really figured out how to get more business by helping the customer get funding That's it. to get the help. Yeah. So, so how did you come up with that and how did that develop? Like that's very I, well, unique. literally how it started was that first client. I was like, how do they pay me? And my, the learning strategist on the campus. So every campus has a dis, uh, uh, disability resource yep. facilitator or learning strategist to help with the disability side of things. I went to them and they are connected. They get paid through student loans per province. And uh, so I went in and figured out how to, how to use the proper language to match what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at there's specific provinces. So I have uh, like Newfoundland, for example, doesn't uh, they have a, uh, clause that says ADHD coaching not um, not, included, not included, right? Just switch the language, and it's. I'm not going to say exactly what all the language yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I work really hard to find it, but um, but yeah, there 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 is a way to do it. Um, so it started with that, and then my next thing that came up was like, well, I've got all these students coming out of school. And the next big transition is careers. So what do I do with them? And so I happen to be on a board of directors with an organization called uh, um, Nova Scotia Works. Mm -hmm. um, again, every province will have a version of this. It's uh, usually funded through um, EI, through employment insurance. Yep. So it's like the big government job banks, right? Right. They have pots of money or and and they also have like organizations that deal in like specific niches so the one that i deal with is like a disability friendly organization they've been around for 35 years and uh anyways i went in did a little pitch i said hey i've got 40 students that i'm coaching coming out uh that need help with like resumes cover letters what have you um and I want, I don't want to have them dropped on their ass when they're out. Yeah. Um, can I refer them in? They're like, yeah, sure. No problem. So 
they were, I referred like literally 40 people into this organization, right? In the, my first year. And, and then what happened is when they were getting into um, now like shifting gears and looking for jobs and, you know, transition for our, us is super hard. Um, they were running into problems. And then, so basically, essentially what happened was these organizations didn't know how to handle those problems, but I did, mm -hmm. right? So they contracted, they basically gave the student or now person in career transition funding through another pot of money to come back and hire me on. And I work in cahoots, right? So now we've got three of us working to help move them forward. Wow, that's amazing. And, um, yeah. to, to try to spin that around to help the client to be able to get help from you is, is that's monumental, especially with government funding. Well, this is it. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was interesting when it did all start to click, right. I, mm -hmm. It just clicked in my head and I went back to the people that were dealing more in mental health, like the typical ways of getting support is either through clinical or nonprofit, right? Right. Nonprofit is a big organization that's going to a big pot of money in the sky, hoping that they funnel a little bit of it to you, right? But with the with the nonprofit world, and this is part of the reason I'm very fortunate I didn't have to go nonprofit. I consider myself a social entrepreneur, but I am definitely for profit. Um, is that in a nonprofit world, I could be the guy coming up with all the ideas, but I also have a board of directors sitting over top of me, right? And if they get sick and tired of me, they can boot me out for my own idea. And I was yeah. like, I don't want to be like that. Yeah, I'll figure it out from a different perspective. So. Now, the thing is, I will point a social entrepreneur. I know a lot of people imply it, they think or should be nonprofit, but that's not true. There's a no. lot of social entrepreneurs there are for profit. We need yeah. to live. We yeah, need to live. live. <laughs> the only way we can help other people or other organizations or whatever you, the social thing you want to help, you yeah. need money. We um, need money. Yeah. And, and, the, and you know what? We need the individual entrepreneur, not a nonprofit, because it's a different mindset. Nonprofits True. are, it, they're, it's more of a corporate mindset. Yep. But being a social entrepreneur, we need that entrepreneurial spirit to make change. And, exactly. and, it's, and it's for profit. Exactly. Okay. Wow. We can go on for hours on this. I, <laughs> I, I love the fact how you took your experience, your life, you dug out of it, you got help. Mm -hmm. And you saw that you need to go another step and then you create an advocacy. And then you saw that there was a challenge for the client about paying. Yeah. And then you solve that problem for them. No problem. And that's the reason why you are right here right now. And, you yeah. know, lots of con congratulations. I love that. What's the one piece of advice you can give our listeners right now? Uh, in what context? Anything. Um, well, I guess I, I think just the power of persistence, right? The, the, I guess coming back to this, this idea of that there is a challenge in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, if you, so here's a classic thing that comes up in the coaching I do is like, well, I hit a wall. I, I'll give you an example of one of the entrepreneurs I'm coaching that it's like um, sent an email out and somebody said no, right? Yeah. So he's like, well, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going to pursue it anymore. I was like, that's one person, man. It's like, yeah. you know, if, if you're on classic thing about uh, doing cold calling, for example, sales stuff, not that I consider myself a sales salesy person per se, but you know, for <clears throat> every hundred calls, you might get one person that, that actually yep. will buy off you. I have the reverse. <laughs> like I, I do six uh, discovery calls a week. And what I've done is like hone in my story. Here's, this is yeah. an, uh, this will kind of works works for all this is that that um, the uh, you know if if you're genuine and you tell yourself from a, from a, working at yourself from a, a genuine perspective um, other people and and other people see that that you're just coming in as a genuine person mm -hmm. they will help you out I guess that's my my biggest thing and if if you find never something again that yeah, never give up yeah don't just don't give up and I, it's hard to say don't give up. But if, if you're finding yourself hitting a wall, reach out to somebody who can help you get over that wall. Figure whoever. out the obstacle. Yeah. Every, like for me, every, my biggest growth has always been I hit a wall and I figured mm -hmm. out how to get over that wall. Mm -hmm. Every obstacle is an opportunity for growth. That's so exactly I, it. I love that. Not to give um, up. Yeah. Where can uh, people re reach out to you, Keith? 
Um, so if you do want to reach out, um, best thing is you go on my website. So it's advocacy.org. That's A-D-D-V-O-C-A-C-Y dot O-R-G. Uh, best thing to do is go up top right hand corner and book an appointment with me. I am booked up for about a month, but it's worth it because you're going to talk to me, not my secretary or anybody <laughs> else. Um, I'll we'll put that. We'll put the links in the show notes too. Yep, I'll give you give you an hour to to talk yeah. about whatever you want. And if I and the thing is, if I can't help you, I'll find somebody who can. I'm a solution focused guy, so yeah. Uh, and that's why it. we connect very well. Yes. Uh, you're not for everyone. I'm not for everyone. Nope. <laughs> but we all know someone that could help you. That's absolutely if you it. want it. All right, cool. Now, listeners, three things from this. Like he said, get to know yourself. Very important after the diagnosis for self-growth. Because he learned there was no one there for the next stage of growth after therapy. So I thought that was very powerful. No matter where you started from, you determine where you get to. And you need that yourself, self-determination. Use those ADHD strengths to go. And what I really liked is when you said migraines didn't reflect my need to help people. Yeah. Right. Not all of us are wired for the school system, but they don't measure that side of you wanting to help people. And I give you congratulations. I really like that you persisted because you do have the gift to help people and you genuinely care yes, and you want to solve care. the problem not just band-aid symptoms and call it a hack. Exactly. So I got a lot of respect for you. I've read some of your stuff. Please reach out to Keith. Um, he's a really great resource. Um, thanks again, everyone, for listening. Um, if you like this episode, please share with at least two people. And please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a rating and comments. And if you got any ideas or comments about this episode, you can email me at questions at the impulsive thinker.com. Thanks again for listening and take care.